Welcome everyone. Um, we are here for week nine of COVID class and we're glad that you all chose to spend a Thursday night here um, with Dr. Newton and I and our, and our guests. It's gonna be a great Thursday night too. Uh, I've been looking forward to this week, the whole class, I think. Um, I, I think LR, LR talks a pretty big game about educating the whole person. And I think we, we live up to that for the most part, if I can do a little bit of a brag about our school. Um, and, and one of those parts of ourself, right, is the, the creative part, the expressive parts of ourselves. And this is, this is a week that's all about that and, and drawing a connection between that expressive part of ourselves and a social part of ourselves, which is music to my ears as a, as a social psychologist. So I'm very excited about what we're going to be doing this week. Uh, as always, uh, we will uh, have our guest professor for the week um, speak for a little bit at the beginning. Um, and then we're going to change things up a little bit, right? Because you, our, uh, our fantastic class, have uh, bared your souls, right? Um, and, and I don't mean that in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. Like, there really is a lot of vulnerability that comes with sharing yourself. So we're going to hear from some of the people who have shared themselves in this creative and expressive way. Um, Dr. Uh, Lure is our guest professor for the week, has handpicked some. And so I'm really excited to, to get to see that artwork and to experience it alongside of you. Um, as always, please do feel free to jump into the conversation using the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Or for those of you who are joining us on the YouTube live stream, you can also uh, join us through the chat feature there. Uh, we may not get to all of the questions, um, but um, I think that's my favorite part of this class is uh, getting to engage with you in real time. Um, and we're going to make this session available on YouTube tomorrow. So if you're unable to join in the conversation tonight for whatever reason, feel free to do that tomorrow. Good, and um, I get the privilege of introducing our guests tonight, but I would like to say um, for a few of you, um, a number of people emailed me after our last session to ask for the poem that I read at the end, and I have not forgotten you. I just have not gotten it done yet. So I ask for your patience as um, working with kids at home and all the stuff that everyone else is. I will get those to you um, hopefully tomorrow. So just wanted to say that you are recognized and uh, to offer a quick apologies for that. Um, I get to introduce our guests tonight. Um, and our guest professor is Dr. Ryan Lures, who joined Lenore Ryan in the fall of 2016 as assistant professor of music and director of choral activities. Uh, Dr. Lurs directs the a cappella choir at LR and the college singers. He coordinates the sacred music program and mentors our choral music education students. And he is the newly appointed director of the Hickory Choral Society. Prior to coming to LR, um, Dr. Lurs served as assistant professor of music at Andrew College in Cuthbert, Georgia, where he oversaw the music program and directed the college's flagship choral ensemble. He holds a PhD in choral conducting and music education from Florida State University, a master's of sacred music degree from Luther Seminary with St. Olaf College, and a BA in music from Luther College. Dr. Lures was one of 12 song leaders nationwide selected to participate in raising the song, creating communities that sing. Um, Dr. Lures is joined tonight uh, by maestro Matthew Troy, uh, who began his tenure as music director of the Western Piedmont Symphony here in Hickory in the 2019-2020 season. He has held the position of music director and conductor of the Piedmont Wind Symphony in Winston-Salem since January 2015 and has conducted orchestras across the country, including the North Carolina Symphony, the Rochester Philharmonic, the Oklahoma City Philharmonic, Portland Symphony, the Greensboro Symphony, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts Symphony, and the Salisbury Symphony. In April 2018, he crafted a program called Music Without Borders, which focused on the ongoing refugee crisis, both locally and abroad. This concert included music and partnerships for many countries affected by these issues, including a partnership with World Relief and local interfaith groups. 
Uh, Maestro Choi has led performances with many internationally renowned pops and classical artists, including Jennifer Coe, Ben Folds, Boys to Men, Pink Martini, and Dee Dee Bridgewater. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more from him, but first we're going to hear from Dr. Lors. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Trying to share my screen. Here we go. As I do that, uh, I will take a moment to connect us to last week. And that Dr. Shore and I overlapped time at Luther Seminary and actually sang in choir together for two years while she was a professor and I was a student. So we have that time together and it's fun that we've been able to reconnect now that we're in North Carolina. Um, we have a lot to get through today, a variety of things. I wanna begin by recognizing a current event and that is the, the passing and the death of John Lewis last week. And it's relevant to this week for a variety of reasons, but um, perhaps most of all in our, our conversation and exploration of protest music, he uh, has a lot to say about the role the music played in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. In fact, he is quoted as saying, if it hadn't been for the music, civil rights movement would had been would have been like a bird without wings so if you are intrigued by the role that music played in the civil rights movement um, look to him and some of the things he's written and some of the things that he has said about being uh, individually a part of that movement now turning a page to this we're going to watch a virtual choir piece and i thought it might be kind of fun to do that as a group as a, at least those who are tuned in right now that we are watching this synchronously. And it kind of covers all components of this particular week and that it's a, um, it's a virtual choir. So this is a, a way that uh, art is adapting and trying to make itself uh, what, be distributed to an audience even though we're not meeting live for concerts. It's also a form of protest. If you look at the last slide, you will see a bunch of nurses sh shoes and it was a part of a protest to get more um, protective care to nurses especially at the beginning of the pandemic and it's also communal and that we're kind of watching it together as a group even though we're not together being able to hear each other's response or even applaud at the end or hear each other's applause you can um, we can know that we are watching it at the same time and finally it's inspired by the pandemic it is intended to be a tribute to healthcare workers who have lost their lives um, on the front line as they've battled this pandemic. So here is um, Robert Purcell's Lea Garden. And I might need to do this again because I'm not sure if I share my seat. Just give me one moment. I was sharing my sound. I shouldn't have stopped. Well, we'll try one more time. Leia Garland by Robert Purcell.
I it feels like that deserves a beat to just um, sit for a moment. So, um, Dr. Lurz, one thing that you and I uh, have gotten to talk about recently is um, this this idea that one approach to kind of what we're going with is kind of a dry clinical one. So, like understanding the numbers um, is is one way of kind of wrapping our heads around what's going on, and I think that's where we started in this class, right, way back nine weeks ago to Dr. Catherine Tinklenberg um, uh, talking about um, just kind of in a, in a detached way, uh, like um, how many people are going to die if we do this and how many people are going to die if we do this. And of course, that's been the approach that public health officials kind of have to take, right? That, um, that kind of uh, by the book, by the numbers. Um, but this was a very a different kind of experience. Can you can you talk to us about what role art can play in helping us to understand what's happening in a different way? I can try. It's difficult. It's really hard to put into words. But I think above all, maybe if I can say this, art, we're trying to be more human and express our humanity and to see somebody's face and then in combination with a quote from a loved one, in combination with you know a, a funeral ode that's from Victorian England, the combination of the three, there's a lot that we're taking in all at once. And I don't know if any one of those by themselves would be nearly as strong as the, the, the combination of the three at the same time. Yeah, that was, that was a, a huge uh, emotional punch um, sitting here. Um, we're actually rehearsing tomorrow uh, or for yes, yesterday for today. Uh, I kind of didn't want to watch it entirely then because I knew, I knew I wanted to experience it alongside of the other people in this class. And, and I'm wondering, uh, Maestro Troy, you asked us to call you Matt <laughs> to set aside pretension. I'm going to try to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do, do either of y'all have a, a, a reflection on uh, how we can connect to one another through these virtual media? Because that was an intentional choice that you made, Dr. Lurz, right? You wanted us to view this video together instead of posting it on Canvas to watch in advance. Why? Like, what is this doing for us? Do you think either, both of you? Well, I know that I, I would just like to echo what Ryan, what Dr. Lures had said uh, before. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that art always aspires to do is to tap into something transcendent. And I think realizing as 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 we watched and saw those faces on the video, you realize that there is a transcendence about it all. There's a transcendence inside all of us. And so I think the art is inside of all of us, no matter whether you're an artist or a musician or not. Um, and so I think it's incredibly powerful to see those different elements coming together. Um, and I think it does provide us at least a glimpse into something transcendent. And I think that's one of the more difficult things to do over this virtual medium. Um, as a musician, as a conductor, at least, I'm always so concerned about everything being perfectly polished and everything being exactly manicured and perfect so that when an audience hears it it's there's nothing that goes wrong and that's just not the way things function over these this virtual medium and so i think it's in a way it's kind of forced us all to let our guard down in a different kind of way and expose you know a humanity um and let people really kind of see you even though it's virtually in a in a way that it's not always possible when I'm standing on the concert stage in front of an audience and with an orchestra. You know, it's funny. I almost think I would have predicted it would go the other way, uh, Matt, that um, being offline would give you the chance to do as many takes as it takes to attain that. Well, perfection. at least in these kind of live, I mean, some, you're right, I suppose, for some of the pre recorded things, but I think this live format does really um, enable us to, 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 
you have to let go because it, it, it will never be perfect. It, you, I'm not talking off of a script right now. None of us are professionals really at, we're, we're not professionally trained at running Zoom meetings and things like that. So there's always little hitches and you just have to, that's, there's kind of something that it's a metaphor of how, how we all go through our lives. And, and I think there's even a lesson to be learned in that. My, I'm still a little bit sweaty from right before. Uh, yeah. Those of you who are watching, Dr. Lurz was having trouble joining us. And so I was sweating it like right before. And I think that experience of like these technical glitches and trying to smooth them out as much as possible, but kind of uh, abiding in the imperfect humanity of it that's, all. That's right. That's right. You know, something, you, that, it, 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 something that just really struck me watching that, if I may jump in here. And, and Matt, this was something I was going to be very interested in talking with you about is the... Um, when I think of protest music, I always think about the lyrics, um, you know, the, the the stuff coming out of the 60s that, you know, some of those, those songwriters. And yet that video that we just watched, other than the title, which Dr. Lurz, you read to us, I don't think I could tell you a single word from the, that, that song. Um, and yet the power of it. And this is coming from a Victorianist. I mean, that that's what I, Victorian poetry is. That's what I teach. So that should have been the thing that I was tuned into. And I... I not at all. Um, and it just really struck me how powerful just the sound can be, even though I know there are words there. Uh, it, it, there's not a question there. It's just a reflection and a response to the, the power of that piece. It's ethereal. Uh, yeah. at the same time that it was so deeply human and that was true of eric whitaker's the the, the virtual car you had us watch in, in advance too um i actually went back and watched some of his other ones he picks these really ethereal compositions and it, it just it elevates my heart somehow i don't know how it works but nice choices dr yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any reflection on what we just kind of experienced together and what it does for who we are well, I think, first of all, I want to give credit to Tucker Biddlecombe, who produ produced that video and gave us permission to, to show it in this platform. Um, and that's an artistic endeavor in itself. Choir directors having to put something together visually. We're used to working with singers, but now we're trying to make it visually appealing, too. And we're getting excited, I guess, about the possibilities. I'm attending training right now to see how we can put video together along with choral music. I think a lot of professors are feeling that looking towards the fall, too. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> but I, I want to acknowledge, I mean, all of us who do music for a living and perform, we, we yes, there's applause at the end. But I think a lot of times we're, we're going after performance that's so moving that people don't want to applaud. And some of us have had the privilege of experiencing that a few times. And we don't forget those experiences where something has moved us so much that applause doesn't seem appropriate. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, um, and it's harder to feel that. Even yet, then it becomes communal where the entire room, even though the social norm is to applaud, a thousand people just stay silent and nobody wants to be the first one to move because somehow there's something so beautiful that's just happened. They don't want to be the first person to interrupt that heavy, heavy feeling. And that's hard to experience virtually. It's hard to put into words too, but it's, you can't, you can't replace that. You can't replace as Eric Whitaker says, the, the collective breath that you all feel before the singing begins or that, that sense of weight. If you're a conductor, you can feel it behind you when nobody's making a sound because they don't want to disrupt. Well, they just heard. I was going to say just really quickly, I think that's a, such a great point because I think it's so easy to always um, kind of get in the mindset that music, for example, is all about sound, but we have to remember that the silence is just as important as the sound. The silence gives the sound the meaning and vice versa. And so I think realizing how to utilize or how to embrace the silence is absolutely part of understanding how, how, how to feel music, how to listen to music. Yeah, um, that's, uh, so hearing you y'all talk and, and process that experience together, it, it makes me very really excited to jump into the art that uh, our, our students have produced. So not to interrupt this fantastic conversation, which I hope we can continue <laughs> later in the hour, um, but Dr. Luris, could you, um, could you take it away? Could you, could you show us the pieces that you've selected for our showcase here today? Certainly, and first of all, thank you to all who have participated in this and, and put something out there for us to take a look at. I wish we could include everything, but we picked a few. 
a variety of types of students and a variety of media. And we're gonna start with a painting by Sarah Nelson. It's called Heart Firmly Rooted in God. You can see it. And she wrote about it saying, physical distancing can make us feel isolated, but we can take comfort in the fact that God has always right there with us. While walking and worshiping God, I was inspired to paint heart firmly rooted in God. I had a vision of my heart resting in God's hands, which look like the sky because we look up to him. In fact, my heart is firmly rooted in his hands. So God's hands are coming out of a tree trunk and his light is shining brightly from behind because he is the light. I hope this painting can serve as a useful reminder to you too about who holds your heart and who makes everything good for us. Without a doubt, we are loved richly, perfectly, and having done nothing to earn it. Thank you, Sarah Nelson. Robert Bowman wrote a poem for earlier in the course with Dr. Johnson and that, and that week's assignment and he submitted it here too. He needs to have another assignment if, if he submitted that one for later in the week, but we're going to hold off on that right now. And um, this is Robert reciting his, his poem, pandemic poem. Hey, everybody. My name is Robert Bowman. Uh, I'm from a small town called Mebane, North Carolina. I'm a business management major, and I'll be a senior in the fall at LR. But I wrote this poem on the fourth week of this COVID class actually, when our university provost, Dr. Gary Johnson, he discussed grappling with absurdity during a pandemic. And I wrote this poem then. I tweeted slightly, but here it is anyway. A barren land, a barren sea, the schools were closed, the kids were free. To wear a mask was proposed until the man said it's all a hoax. For once we have what others see as undesirably the most to be. All we know Yet cases rise, a healthy man, not meant to die. Mothers mourn, we hear their cries, nothing returns, her son's sweet eyes. The only things that set us free somehow strips our autonomy. Open your mouth and breathe real wide. Hope to see you on the other side. So that's my poem. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Robert. Now we have Ainsley Richardson. It was a watercolor painting. It's a recreation, a famous painting by Joan Sloan called Professional Nurse. And this is Ainsley's. And then a side by side, the original nine, or 1893 painting. And she writes, a few weeks ago, my mother gave me a beautifully illustrated book about the history of medicine as I want to become a doctor when I'm older. I began flipping through the book for inspiration for this project. While there were many pictures of different plagues and pandemics, the painting that caught my eye was a simple 1893 watercolor portrait titled Professional Nurse by John Sloan. It made me realize the vast differences between the nurses of the late 1800s and the nurses of today. The medical advancements we have made during this time are remarkable. The most significant of which right now is the use of personal protective equipment by doctors and nurses. Nurses in COVID wards have to wear layers of masks, goggles, gloves, scrubs, and protective face shields through long work days with little to no breaks. While this is necessary to prevent the spread of disease, it is also very difficult. I decided to highlight the bravery and strength of the modern professional nurse as I recreated this picture for the assignment. One crucial change I decided to make besides the attire is the race of the nurse. In 1893, it would have been rare to see a black nurse working alongside white nurses, especially in the South. With the Black Lives Matter movement bringing awareness to the inequities, inequalities among the black and white races, I thought it was necessary to raise awareness to the past and present inequalities in the workplace through my painting as well. I hope my painting of the nurse in her battle gear, illustrating true bravery, evokes a sense of respect for nurses out there fighting COVID every day. Thank you, Ainsley Richardson. And now Lauren Whitkey, uh, she, she did some cooking as an artistic expression. And I'm gonna argue that her video producing skills are also a form of artistic <laughs> expression. So interdisciplinary, here are some sweet rules. Hopefully you've had something to eat already. Otherwise this is gonna make you hungry. Today I will be making cinnamon roll muffins. 
First, I'm going to preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, I'm going to be combining the brown sugar, baking soda, salt, vanilla, and egg, and whisking it to combine. Then I'm going to add the buttermilk and whisk that until just combined. Next, I'm going to add the flour to the wet mixture, and I'm going to stir that together with a spatula. Then I'm going to continue to add the flour in a quarter cup increments until the dough forms a ball on its own. Now that my dough has formed a ball, I'm going to sprinkle some flour out onto the counter and I'm going to knead that dough until it's no longer sticky and unmanageable. Then I'm going to use a rolling pin and roll my dough out into a sheet pan sized rectangle. Now I'm going to prepare my muffin tins with some olive oil so I can easily get my muffins out. Now I'm going to make the cinnamon sugar filling to go in the middle. Now that I've got everything ready, I'm going to spread some softened butter over my dough and then I'm going to add the cinnamon sugar mixture on top of that. And then I'm going to roll my dough into a tight log and then I'm going to cut it into 12 equal pieces. Once I've finished putting all the muffins in the muffin pan, I'm going to go ahead and bake them for 13 minutes and here is my finished product. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I've always said my wife makes the best cinnamon rolls ever, but I, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> now, as I was thinking, just this quick comment about that. I mean, how can cooking be, how, how does that connect us, especially if you're doing it by yourself? But if it's a recipe that's been handed down to your family or it connects you to a certain place and time, I think it, like music, it can, we know that smell is linked to eating and smell and music and like memories, it can link you to all sorts of places. Um, Next, we're gonna move on to some poetry. And Gina Malone submitted Creating Beautiful Characters, a master class. And I will be reading this. Do we, do oh. we want Gina to read it since she, she was able here? to join us? Yeah. She that was able to join us. So much better. I, <laughs> and I should ask you then, Gina, do you want us to see the words on the screen as you read? Are you okay with that? Or do you just want us to hear it? That's fine if you want to post it, that, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Creating Believable Characters, a master class. I mean, if you think about it, she can be anywhere God can. And so she might have taken a class with the writing teacher who says, make your characters suffer, threaten them with death challenge their views of themselves, of the world, pull the rug out from under their feet so they hit the floor hard and sprawl there, afraid for a time to stand up again, hold knives to their throats, guns to their heads, watch them cringe, see what your characters do then, what they say, make them real by making them suffer. God is the quintessential storyteller, after all, is she not? Who has created characters, setting, conflict, tone, story world. And perhaps the writing teacher said to God, as he did to me, waving the pages of story in my face, nothing really happens to your character. She's just sitting there comfortable on the pages, isn't she? Taking up space, wasting your reader's time, make something bad happen to her. Yes, I think it must be so that God and I had the same writing teacher, a short, smirking little man who was about to come out with another metaphysical novel in which I'm sure he made unspeakable things happen to his characters, tortured them with all the meanness he could muster, pinned them down squirming to the pages. So when God half raised her hand and said, uncertainly, a pandemic maybe, the writing teacher was gleeful. Perfect, he said. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm so glad you were able to join us to read that. Me Thank too. You. <laughs> uh, yes. you know, Gina, after uh, Dr. Lurus shared your poem, uh, with us and, and indicated that he wanted to invite you here tonight. Um, that word squirming 
oh man, it stuck out to me. And I, I just kept thinking my mind is squirming, like in the best way, my mind is squirming right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I should have done this before you spoke, but uh, introduce Gina Malone. She's the editor of the Asheville Laurel and a recent graduate from LR's MFA program in, in Asheville. And Gina, are you willing to talk just briefly about your experience and your discipline of writing poetry during this time? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I began um, in mid-March, uh, not with this idea so much. My, my daughter um, got married. <laughs> she had a sort of a, a socially distanced wedding as it turned out it was already planned and this was march 14th um it was just her dad um uh, me uh, her sister on a screen from from college in boston so um the morning of that wedding you know with this be she's my older daughter with this being a um momentous occasion i thought i would write a poem about it and then a week later i thought that maybe poem writing would be um, better for me than journal writing as a way to, to chronicle what was happening. Um, and so I set myself the task of writing a poem every morning. Um, and I've done that since March 21st to up to 160 or so now. And I, I didn't think it would, you know, I thought maybe this would be a few months and now I'm thinking how long do I have to do this? But, <laughs> uh, I hope at it. some point you stop and look for someone to publish those poems so that we can read them. <laughs> well, I was uh, talking about that with my daughter today and I said, like, who would want to read a book of pandemic poems? I mean, who after going through this would? would everyone, all of us? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point, right? It's a shared experience, right? We're experiencing something together as a species in a way that we never have before. Um, the, the, yeah, I, uh, everyone, Gina. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, at some point I'll have to st stop and and revise. I mean, they're not all, you know, they some of them won't amount to anything, I'm sure, because they're they're drafts. But um, I can pick out a few that I could like, like I did with this one, that revise into something. I think. So. Well, thank you, Gina. It was a real, real gift to us that you could um, share that with share that with us tonight and, and read it yourself, too. I'm glad that you got to read it and not me. It came off much better, I'm sure. Um, now we have Susan Harris, and Susan is from Lincolnton, and she is training for lay preachers in the North Carolina Synod of the ELCA. She is married to Ray Harris and has two children and five grandchildren, and will read for us, recite for us, the, a Susical COVID-19. Hearts are filled with quite endless hope as we all maneuver this slippery slope. Is it too soon or not soon enough? What we don't know is so very tough. If we knew all the answers, wouldn't life be great? But instead, through this time, we wait and we wait. We hope and we pray that things will get better, but we must adhere to the rules by the letter. People cover their mouth and their nose with a mask. But what else is necessary, I anxiously ask. You must wash your hands for 10 seconds, they say, and practice self-distancing and staying away. There is no gathering of large groups of people, not even at church underneath that tall steeple. The dress of the day is jammies and slippers, and a few brave souls cut their hair with their clippers. A new day is dawning with blessings to keep. Our spirits are lifted from the deepest deep. The sun is rising, erasing our fear. The silence is broken with voices so dear. One of these days we'll all be together and playing outside in the warm sunny weather. It's hard to believe, but that day will be here and we'll go out in the street and raise up a cheer. Hooray, hooray, it is a new day. COVID-19 has gone away. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And can you, can you share with us uh, the role poetry plays in your life, especially during a pandemic? Well, um, I think I write out, out of emotion. Um, some of the, the things that I have written, poems, and I do some shorts, uh, some prose. 
Um, and it's, it's mostly comes from emotion. Um, when I'm feeling, you know, when I'm upset, when I'm angry, when I'm sad, that's where my, uh, a lot of my writing comes from. And, and this, um, I did, um, actually for a, a little literary contest and wrote it just quickly and, and, um, it was just something kind of lighthearted. And it's worth noting, by the way, that that little literary contest that Susan just mentioned, she placed uh, two of her poems placed in that literary competition. It wasn't this one, Not which surprised one. me, <laughs> but two of her other poems uh, did. So congratulations, Susan. Thank you. You know, I'm wondering if um, this is a question that, that came up in our Q&A here, but it's it's one that I'm wondering as well. I mean, just the range of my emotions in the 37 minutes <laughs> since we started this has been all over the place. Do any of you know what physiologically happens as we experience art in this way? Uh, that might be a, a Dr. Newton question in, in some ways. I don't know if you've got any insight there from a psychologist's perspective or, or Matt or Dr. Lurz, if you've got anything there. No, I think that this is Dr. Lurz's wheelhouse precisely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> bus throw <laughs> honestly it's really hard to I, mean, I keep it's it's really a it's it's a cheap answer just to say it's hard to put into words what we're feeling I mean when you're at a, a concert or experience something and you get goosebumps why would your body respond with goosebumps and with your hair standing on edge I mean I I, I really don't I mean it gets back to I, like I said, I don't, I'm going to just meander all over the place. If anybody else wants to try to. Try to <laughs> I just know, I, I mean, I, I know I miss the feeling. I miss the feeling. There's been nothing that's really been able to recreate it during the pandemic for me as being on the stage conducting an orchestra. Earlier this year, Dr. Lures and I had the chance to collaborate on a concert with the LR choirs. And so we had an entire symphony orchestra plus about 150 singers and I mean, I felt like at the end of it that I was literally just kind of radiating energy in a, in a, I mean, just after that experience, it was so powerful. And so there's nothing really that does it, but I do think it kind of, it does call to mind since we've got writers on this conversation as well. I do kind of think of the Walt Whitman, I sing the body electric, you know, kind of comes to mind It kind of this electric energy, but it's, it is something that we, I don't know, it, it's hard to describe, but it's there's nothing that quite replaces that during this time, I think. If I, while we still have uh, Gina and Susan here, um, Gina, I was really struck by your, um, I'm writing a poem every day. And I think this connects to the the same question of the, the physiological, the response to it. I, I'll be a little open here and say that during the pandemic, I have, I have benefited greatly from those who have created art, from the poets, from the musicians. Um, and yet I find myself not in a place where I want to create. And I wonder if any of you can speak to that. I mean, I'm a musician, amateur, very amateur musician, but that's my my artistic outlet. And I think I've picked up my my mandolin maybe twice since we broke from from spring break. So have y'all had that problem? Have you have you felt that feeling of I don't want to create right now? And what do you do about it? Other than Gina, I love your your I dig in and I write one every single day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have I had writing time. Um, I have it set aside every day anyway um, because my my day job which is also writing, but it, it's magazine writing. It's not the creative writing that I love. So I have this time, it's sacred to me, seven days a week, every morning, the first thing I do is write. So, I mean, sometimes it's it's junk and I don't feel like doing it, but, um, but I think I feel better for spending that time every day doing it because it's a, it's a process. It's for me, it's, I'm asking questions like I don't I don't sit down with wisdom I, I I'm asking questions and trying to figure this out myself and that's the best way I can do it is is with with my writing how about you Susan I'm so you're obviously prolific too in, in what you've produced and not uh, that, not that prolific. <laughs> context two of the other poems that you submitted were very um 
um, serious in their tone, right? And yes. this was very yes. lighthearted, uh, yes. which I think is what stood out to us when we were reading it, is you're not seeing very much lightheartedness, uh, hearing the cadence of Dr. Seuss and analyzing like this <laughs> moment that we're in. It's jarring almost. Yeah. How about you? What's your, uh, what's your experience of creativity like right now? Well, I, I've, um, I, I haven't written as much as I sometimes do. And, and I did go through a period of time that I didn't feel like the, the words just were not there. And, and I think in, in the beginning of this whole, you know, social distancing, stay at home, we didn't know how long it was going to last. And, and as I said to someone, I said, I don't want to this, you know, to be confined to my house or for two or three months and not have something to show for it. So I wanted to to be able to have something to to actually either, you know, physically or or somehow show have something to show. And um I've done um I've done kind of a, a diary on social media and every day I post on social media what I've done that day. Um, it might be pictures of food that I've cooked or somewhere that I, you know, I've been a picture, you know, a, a photograph I took of nature, but that's my, that, that's my way. Um, I've, you know, I, one of my things I've been making masks for people, uh, mostly family members and friends. And so I sew or I do something creative. I try to. Wow. And so, so similarly kind of uh, making space for it, even if it doesn't feel like that's what you want to do. It's an yes. intentional choice for both of you. Ah, that's, that's a cool common thread. I wonder if, uh, if Matt and Dr. Lurz are going to share something similar. But before we get there, I, I wanted to thank you both so much for joining us right now. Uh, I, I don't think we adequately warned you with how long we were going to engage you in conversation. We we're just like, will you come read? And now we're grilling you. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Uh, before we dig into the other uh, content, uh, we really thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so how about you, uh, Dr. Lurs? Um, what has the creative process been like for you at this moment? Well, it's interesting that I still feel as someone who's putting together virtual choirs and learning about that, that part of me, and as being a college professor right now, trying to put these videos together and pre-recorded lectures, there's a certain art to that and overcoming insecurities about watching myself on all that is, is part of this process but I'm, I'm I'm more stuck in the fact that I, I'm someone who likes to lead people in singing and we can't do that right now like I feel called more than ever based on our division as a country uh, I miss le weekly leading people in church it's one of the favorite things I do leading people who haven't practiced I mean I like to work with choirs too and Make sure the the cutoffs and the breathing is in the right place and phrasing, but I get a lot of um, joy out of sitting at a at a piano or an organ and having a room full of people singing a hymn, and we're not doing that right now. So I feel called to help help do something, and I think based on the, the my first lecture talking about what music does when we're singing together and the connectedness, we need that right now. I can't we can't do that. So that's where I'm struggling that a lot of what you get from creativity is that social something. Yeah, just getting a room full of people singing. And yeah, obviously we're not doing that right now. Mm. Maestro Troy, you've been doing, oh, sorry, pretension. Uh, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> you've been <laughs> doing similar social projects online. How satisfying are you finding those? Uh, they're, they're satisfying to the degree that I, think that they're helping it as as Ryan said it's just a challenge to um, for an orchestra if you're uh, you know with a professional orchestra you can't put on concerts right now so what do you do and how do you keep this organization viable and afloat and so it's it's rewarding in the sense that I think we we see our patrons and people really engaging with us and really know it being sympathetic to how difficult this time is um, and it is it is fun to kind of explore things definitely in ways that I've never done before. We've put together 
watch parties with all kinds of different topics. We've got some of those planned for the fall. Um, we've I've started a series called Play On, which our musicians are doing uh, almost every week or two, and that's helping raise money for us. Um, I, we've even started, we're about to release experience packages because a lot of people are now cooking at home more and they're at home more. So I've actually kind of put together a Spotify playlist and I've pre-prepared menus and wine and wine pairings with things. So literally it's all pre-packaged. All, <laughs> all you have to do is hit play on the Spotify so list and then, you, and then you go through and you just follow the recipes. And a lot of them are family recipes of mine that I'm kind of sharing. And so those are those are cool we've got a whole list of those that are coming out but you know it doesn't i i love doing those things because they're a way that we can connect with people right now it's not exactly the same for me personally uh so i started off as a violist my, my instrument was playing viola i still play um and i started when i was very young when i was seven or eight years old um and so for me, I don't have a group of musicians to work with now. So this has been an interesting chance for me to kind of reconnect with that side of my self as a musician. Um, and so I've been playing a lot. I make time to play every day. I do still study my scores every day, but it's not with the same intention. Usually it's with, you know that there's a concert coming up. What's my next concert and you're preparing. And so this is now... For me, it's it's been a lot more exploratory. I can kind of take the time that I wouldn't otherwise have to look into things and listen to things that I maybe would not be allowing myself the time to do in the, a normal world. And so, you know, I think I'm trying to trying to find the silver lining, obviously, <laughs> is when, when I can, as much as I can. For my I, consumer, oh, uh, just one thought to kind of follow up on that, uh, as someone who's not producing but consuming art um your play on project one silver lining that really struck me when i was going through some of the videos from the musicians who are a part of the western piedmont symphony was uh, i thought it was so cool to get to hear from the individual musicians what the pieces mean to them whereas yep. i wouldn't get that sitting in the salt block having yep. a that's live right. concert experience that's right i think it kind of it, it again it breaks as i said earlier it 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 this new medium kind of makes us confront things in a different way and it, it, it allows us to experience things in ways and, and for us I think it's easy you know most audiences look on stage and they see a large group of kind of musicians and you're not really sure who's who on the stage sometime and so this is a great way to make it personal and and to realize that an orchestra is a living organism it's a it's a group of people That's it's a, it's a group of people and these people all have their stories. They all have things that they love and care about. And they're all trying to share those things right now. I interrupted you, Dr. Fisher. <laughs> uh, Dr. Fisher's camera has seemed to go. Oh dear. <laughs> kaput. So if you want to carry on, I will try to get that fixed. Okay. Well, you don't have to uh, talk to me too much. Uh, can, can we, can we return to the idea of perfection? Um, so Susie, uh, asked a question on the the live stream and she she wants to know do we know why people quit singing during protests is it more than generational and when I was reading that sorry I'm not the expert here but I had a thought uh, connecting it back to what we were thinking about before for um, uh, like the pursuit of perfection can almost be intimidating to people and uh, apologies to Dr. Lurs, we're we're good friends, and he's tried to invite me to the virtual choir that he's been putting together, and I'm like, nope, I'm too wretched a singer to put myself out there in that very vulnerable way. So, like, is is there something about the the culture, how we're educated about music, um, that we're that we've lost, preventing us from engaging and, and from participating in music instead of just consuming pre-recorded stuff is there something there that helps us to understand where we are oh that's a bad question because the question got lost <laughs> I, no but can, can no, you find the thread <laughs> yeah i mean those of us who care about these things ask people why they don't sing and people actually have done research and they a lot of people at least a quarter of the population says they don't sing because somebody told them they weren't good yeah. at it yeah. and then like much like where you remember where you were on September 11th when you got the news or with JFK, you remember that moment the rest of your life. You can't take it away. Yeah. Um, and 
I always quote my hymnody teacher from, from Luther Seminary, who, who um, says there's a special place reserved in hell for people, it's bad theology, but for people, for especially music <laughs> teachers, for music teachers who tell their kids they can't sing or, no, you know what, just don't, don't sing on this, this spot. Because we don't forget that and we carry that with us into adulthood. It's, it's remarkable how many adults will talk about first, second grade when somebody told them they can't sing and then they don't. And it's just one, it's just one of many things. I mean, we could talk about gender and what ideal masculinity might look like and how, how broadly do we, do we define masculinity? Because somewhere along the line, um, singing became associated with being feminine. And if you have to make a decision about being in a choir around middle school, when your peer group is your primary motivation, being accepted by your peer group, and you're going to try th something that may not fit into a gender norm for your gender, goodbye choir for a lot of folks. Not everybody does that, but it's a really unfortunate um, consequence if we think that just football and big trucks is all that it means to be a man. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if that's it, we are in trouble as a culture if we can't have expressive men who do art and sing and do. I mean, that's just, a, you could speculate on this for a long time, but I think those things contribute to why people don't sing. Is it new? Is this a new phenomenon? I think the new part is the technology piece where you can, you can have music at your fingertips without creating it. A few generations ago, you'd make the music yourself. You wouldn't just get your phone out and listen to it. You'd have to. Back in the Renaissance, folks would sing madrigals after dinner. That was the after dinner entertainment. <laughs> Get out the books and we're going to sing together and you'd also besides the act of singing together you have a repertoire of songs that everybody would know and mm -hmm. as you mentioned i think you mentioned that uh, in our talking at the protest for black lives matter we sang amazing grace but that's the go-to piece for every situation somebody dies protest just about anything we're going to sing amazing grace because that's the song we know and then uh, and on top of that the lack of people who know how to lead or are willing to lead that's not part of our training or education as, as musicians to lead, unless you're a church musician, and then usually that's just leading from the keyboard. We don't, we don't train people to lead singing in, in person. It's not really a part of any degree program. It just has to be somebody interested in doing that. And then lastly, our venues, if you're in a venue that really is geared towards amplified music, that means you have carpeted surfaces instead of hard surfaces and we have hard surfaces. We don't feel alone when we sing. We feel like we're part of a community. Our imperfections aren't exposed because the sound is swimming around. But if we're in a highly carpeted, quote unquote, dead room, you feel like you're exposed. You don't want to sing as much. And then, yeah, you, you don't participate. So as a follow up to that, Dr. Lores, and this, this is for both of you, really. Um, this is a question coming from Lee in the, the, um, in the, the community or in the class here. How do we teach the younger generation this? I mean, you're both in, in a certain way, you're both teachers um, in a very, I mean, in very real ways, you're both teachers. How, how do we teach that? What's the, what would be your vision? That, that music binds us together, that there's a positive role for this, especially as we think about addressing social concerns. Mm. Wow, I see. I see you're being very quiet, Dr. Lohr. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. As, I'll take that as my cue. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, oh boy. Uh, you know, I think what's interesting to me is that the pandemic, in some ways, has been this great equalizer, where it's it's. You know, I'm I'm watching videos of Yo-Yo Ma struggling with the same issues on his iPhone microphone as as I am, and so, you know, it's. In that sense, it I think it has done something good, again, by just kind of making a, a more level playing field in this virtual medium that we're communicating. Um, and I think that's part of it. But I think from in terms of as a teacher, uh, I think really, again, I deal mostly with professional musicians, but I've done a lot of work with students before. I always love my work with students, but the more I do, the more I'm always amazed at when you stop and step back and think about it, they're really one and the same. I think any great conductor is a great teacher. <laughs> um, and so, because that it's, it's just really uh, in, the, in the details in, in terms of what you're working on. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you're after the same you're seeking the same result. You're seeking for people to be fearless in their performance, for them to 
be willing to share something and but it's it's partly my job it's partly dr lure's job to create that atmosphere in rehearsal where or in performance as well where people feel empowered to express themselves they feel empowered to take a risk or to do just to, to really go for it um so i think it's it's really there is a psychology in terms of just how you create the right atmosphere that enables people to give everything that they have and and give it in a really honest and authentic kind of way and i would just quickly add to that perhaps it's something that's out of our control and that might be happening right now that as a culture, we might have more vulnerability and fear and have to rely on each other. Most of us haven't had to do that in our good life. Point. We've lived in pretty good, not too yeah. many trouble, not everybody, but those of us who are, we don't have, we don't need each other as much. Maybe if it comes to a point where we actually need to rely on our neighbor, we'll start, we'll start Love, singing together more. Start loving our neighbor. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, that, 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 so we've been picking up like these breadcrumbs of maybe possible bright sides along the way. That seems like an important one, um, that this is an opportunity to step back and reflect on what's important, not to minimize the suffering, of course, that is happening and that's far more important than these silver linings that we can look for, but that that opportunity for social connection to be drawn together um, in, 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 um, in, in the fire of things. Uh, the, being able to to find our way toward each other um it doesn't feel like that's what's happening uh, in our political landscape but maybe music offers us a shimmer of hope um as such a universal human experience as you pointed out in your lecture dr lurs um so okay um uh, art um <laughs> art seems to have like um uh, like when it's formally taught, like there's a right way of doing things, right? So there's technique and theory, and there's a there's a, a, a traditional correct way to produce it that can then be subverted in different ways to communicate something. Um, and so it's not necessarily, and I just said that there's a right way to do things, and I see you saying no, and I agree with that, that the subversion itself is part of the message. And I'm thinking of like Picasso, who is a fantastic technical artist, um, who then subverted that, um, that into a new expressive mode. Um, and, and then you had us watch Anthony McGill too, Dr. Lurs playing America the Beautiful with the wrong notes, as he put it, in a minor key. And Gina Malone just had this poem uh, that um, talked about God as, as feminine. And, and I, I love that because it gave pause, right? It was subversive in a way. It, it, is this a time of subversion in our art, Dr. Lurs, Maestro Troy, Matt? Well, it gets our attention, if I have a short answer. Uh, you, this one, these are probably short answer ones. We're we're at eight o'clock. Done uh, it again. Unbelievably, <laughs> but I do think give a, if you've got a one sentence answer for us on that I'll, one. I'll just say really quickly. You know, anybody that any concert you come to of mine, there's always an element of being sub, subversive in pretty much every concert I put together. It's it's something that I think is so important in terms of what art is and what art does. I'm always looking for certain ways to be subversive um, in the way that I program concerts that we perform. Huh. Cool, so here in the age of subversion. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're out of time. Uh, you know, I wanted to give one quick shout out for you uh, burgeoning artists out there. Uh, we had a golden age of art in Hickory, North Carolina. That's true in Asheville and Columbia too, but check out who we have here with us. We have the newly appointed director of the Hickory Choral Society, the newly appointed maestro of the Western Piedmont Symphony. And uh, we also have a new director of the Hickory Art Museum in John Carpac. No. So all much of our leadership in the arts is brand new here in Hickory. It's an exciting time. And speaking of the Hickory Arts Museum, Art Museum, uh, they are inviting the community to to join in in the creation of art with them. Uh, it's called the Raise Your Voice Project, um, and uh, there's a big canvas uh, in the in the gallery, and they're inviting people to take a part of it and to create something. So if you are interested in in contributing to communal art here in our own community. Um, 
um, all you need to do is send an email with a brief description of what you had in mind and your name and contact information to connect HMA at hickoryart.org. So perhaps you can consider joining in that project um, here in Hickory. Could um, you say that again, Dr. Newton? Sure. Connect HMA at hickoryart.org. Um, and so we're out of time. I'm so grateful for both of you joining us here this evening. I feel like uh, I learned a lot. And although I'm not still going to participate in your virtual choir, Dr. Lurs, uh, I am working on a recipe <laughs> inspired by your uh, call to art for us here. So thank you for encouraging us to grow in that way together. And it my last comment before we get just a quick preview of what's coming next week we've had at least one request for the cinnamon roll recipe so if <laughs> i don't know if it would be possible to find that baker if if we're able to do that we'll get it posted we'll on the course website so dr Dunn, what have we got coming for our final week of covid class so uh dr carrie fufhausen um, please, uh, I, I'm so sorry, Carrie, if I am <laughs> mispronouncing your last name. Uh, she is going to be joining us to talk about mental health, which I think is a very natural extension of this opening of ourselves and creative expression to talk about how to take care of mental health and the mental health impacts that this pandemic has had uh, across uh, disparate communities. Awesome. So, we next look week forward to hearing from you and then seeing you i guess we don't actually see you but but talking with you and and being together next thursday night so thank you all thank you again to matt troy and to uh dr ryan lurs for being here with us tonight and to susan harris and gina malone for taking the time to share their words with us and to all of you participants for sharing your artistic creations with us we very much appreciate it and we will see you next week